Um, you have me at two disadvantages. Um, one, I'm Colin, not Sean. Um, <laughs> so, uh, standing in. Um, and also, my background is a mechanical engineer um, with a passion for data. So, standing in front of a room of track engineers is also a bit intimidating, but I'll do my best to, to take you through <coughs> detailed vehicle modelling, which, which has the subtext of the 153-155 as what we can do with better vehicle modelling and why we should strive for it. Um, a bit of, bit, bit of background to me, I'm the MD of D-Gage. We've been, D-Gage as a consultancy tackles difficult gauging issues. The easy ones seem to, you know, we, we've got lots of processes out. It's the really difficult ones which cost us the a huge amount of money. So we we set up to, to basically ask the industry for these kind of difficult challenges, and can we support it? Me as a background um, mechanical engineer, but also um, I've, I worked in motorsport for a long time. Which what fundamentally gives you a big passion for data and what can you do with with data? How can you use it better? Which is something which we'll touch on in this presentation. Um, also, I note that it's uh, the, the starting that is X and Y for gauging. I just want to add another dimension, Z, which is going to become increasingly difficult to manage in gauging terms, and, uh, and I'll, I can point out where and when, if I can get it to work. Fundamentally, I've used the, the first slide here. Along the bottom are things which we can do with better vehicle modelling and the kind, the kind of timescales which, which the industry and, and ourselves have worked to, towards. We talk about dynamic pantograph gauging, so that was the way we used the methodology of, of um, vehicle and passenger introductions in pantograph gauging and freight gauging specifically. How can we use the same principles of localised track forces and sways? Transitional gauging, we need better vehicle models. Um, transitional gauging, fundamentally at the moment we can use worst case situations, maximum curve radiuses which are experienced, but gauging likes constant curvature. With the transitional uh, approach, the front of the vehicle and the back of the same vehicle could be doing very different things. And if we actually look at gauging models which we use in our clear and type assessment, they're actually only half. They're actually typically only the front or the back of the vehicle. So we do need better vehicle models so that we can represent what the front and the back is doing. Um, another reason why Z is important. Dynamic movements. Um, we are all familiar with uh, roll uh, and sway drop of a vehicle. But all, uh, it seems that a lot of new vehicles which are coming on board have asymmetric bogies. They are attached to their, other, their supporting cars in novel ways, which means the behaviour of pitch and yaw is also going to come in as well as roll, lateral and vertical. Again, again this Z component is, a, is going to be a big challenge for us. Um, route assessment and articulation. There, you know, ultimately, we already have a number of articulated vehicles, but that is as well. We need far better information to, to do articulation modelling and 3D movements. So just, just a, a flavour of the kind of things which we can do with better vehicle models. Oops. One slide on, on who we are. Um, we fundamentally started as a research organisation. Um, the side on RSSB said challenge the standards. I think that we've done our best to challenge as many standards as we, as we can because that's the only way we, we drive things forward. We still are very active in, in the research. We still represent a lot of gauging panels and just trying to understand the future. Innovation, all these good things which we can get with more data, we actually need the technology behind to use it. It's all very well collecting data, storing data, but how can we use it effectively? And anyone who's ever had an experience of big data will actually know that the biggest issue is their noise. It's not actually about how do we use all of it, it's how do we use the right bits. Um, we've got some stuff in the lobby which I've, I've, I've bored a lot of you to death with, um, but ultimately we need the technology to keep up with, with the increase of, of what we're doing engaging with. <coughs> The bottom one, accuracy and application, which I think is the, where we're going to go on to the 153, 155. We've always targeted on challenges which people have come to us with uh, and making sure that we come up with a, a tool and a, and a methodology for that, which in this case was brought to us by, by David and, and Kevin on this 153, Quick overview of the kind of things which you can do with better vehicle modelling. Um, dynamic pantograph gauging, we got involved with uh, a lot of critical historic structures. So by using better pantograph gauges and pantograph models, getting 
using uh, modelling where uh, traditional CAD approaches weren't giving us the, the space we needed, we managed to reduce the track lower uh, a substantial number of sites. Um, dynamic freight gauging, um, that was one where um, the, uh, we worked with the likes of Charles Vary in, and, and John Archer in Network Rail to understand, actually, do we need to touch all these platforms or is it that the freight gauges, the old second generation static gauges, are they hitting too many things? Do we know more things about what goes into a W gauge than we did before? Uh, route, feasibility, route feasibility. So. If we're looking at enhancements, we've got all these new vehicles, we've got all these PG1, PG2 electrification. Actually, which one should we use? Um, and, and what does it mean from a feasibility perspective? Vehicle modelling is an absolute passion for us because, actually, if, if we look at the balance of clearance and, uh, clearance and stepping, the easiest thing we can do to start off with is make sure we, we have, we're using the right swept envelope. And so from a clearance perspective, are we, have we got conservatism in the swept envelope? And can we take that out to make more space? And, and passenger and stepping interface worked a lot on Thameslink Core to understand not only using tra transitional assessment and level access, but also gap fillers. And if we're going to have contact, what does that contact mean? What's the likelihood behind those kind of contacts? Another way we can use, uh, look, at, look at gauging. Jump to the 153, 155 sprinter work. Show of hands, how many people have had a headache from 153, 155 in their gauging assessment? Pretty good, excellent. Good topic then. Um, we were uh, asked to support uh, Network Rail um, in understanding the issues behind it. Um, and so from, from our perspective, we, we started by looking at what the gauging history was and what the vehicle history is. We, um, we classify a vehicle in, in D-gauge world as a low, a medium or a high vehicle model. Anything which is going to come from a new manufacturer or a current bidder is of high resolution. So that means you've got a lot of profile <coughs> definition and you've got a lot of dynamic information. For us as, as designers, for us as, as introducers, that means that we have a lot more certainty about how much shape it's going to be. So if we have to go to positive clearance, we have more confidence that positive clearance is actually going to be achieved. As we go back in history, that data just simply isn't there. Um, and so we, if we have a vehicle with a low resolution, we typically have very poor profiles and we have very poor dynamic information. And the 153, 155 is the lowest, or was the lowest of the low. Um, so, so typically, we've got low, medium and high. There's a halfway house in that you can have very accurate profile data, but you might not have the information on how the vehicle dynamically moves. And that depends on how much design information you have. And so for a lot of historic vehicles or, or, or heritage vehicles, that information is available. So if it, I, I, would, I would challenge everyone, when they're doing their gauging assessment, first have a look. What level of vehicle model is it? Is it a low, is it a medium, or is it a high? Um, we, we looked at the vehicle models, remember, lowest of the low. Um, the investigation is, what is out there? You know, we, we're going back circa late 80s with these vehicles. Who has what? Who owns them? Um, who supports them? Who maintains them? Um, at, the, at the front of the slide, we, we put a, a, shout, a shout out really to Porterbrook and, and to Resonate, um, two bodies which have helped us hugely in this. Porterbrook, not least being the vehicle owners, so they have the world's biggest library on vehicle data you can imagine. Again, big data, lots of noise. Um, but for the purposes of this, we managed to dig out old uh, sway test data. We managed to get, we had to review over 800 individual components and vehicle drawings to see what is right and what is relevant. From a development perspective, we then, uh, we commissioned Resonate to do a lot of vampire work and to update that. Um, and we, we, we uh, D-Gage, worked with Portwood to do the, um, the profiles. And the conclusion is now that you all have a, a new gauging model, which is provided in the industry standard format. It's not gauging software specific, it's there for the industry. Um, and obviously at the start of it, we, we didn't know if it would yield the savings or what savings it would yield, but very, it seemed to be very positive to date. A bit of the challenge which we've got facing forward, um, going back to data and why we're so passionate about it, it's an exponential curve. If we're struggling with gauging data today, tomorrow we are really going to struggle. If I look at the left, um, 
when Clear Route started to become mainstream in the late 90s, early 2000s, that's where we started to get dynamics. So we moved from having fixed static envelopes and, and static clearance to dynamics and BAS 501 and sway tests. Now, Vampire or Simpact equivalent multi-body simulations are absolutely, um, absolutely kind of standard. Um, they are exceedingly complicated vehicles. They, we have gone to the level of asking the manufacturer to provide every level of information, uh, uh, um, and, and I'll, I can explain why. It's not, it's not about just putting more detail in for the, for the nature of it, but fundamentally, when we're doing gauge clearance analysis, we don't want to know it's foul to a 155, 153. We want to know at what, what, what is it foul to? What risk does that introduce to the project? And, and all those kind of good things. Infrastructure data, I'm not going to get started on um, because it's an absolute passion. Um, but I think it just shows where we are. You know, we, we've, Network Rail are uh, increasing their measurement program day by day. Um, they have incredibly challenging KPIs of getting more data. My, my challenge is, what are we going to do with that data? If it's over four years old, why are we throwing it out? If I use an analogy um, in, back into my motorsport career, you don't take one lap time and then assume who's won the race. We use it to build up an empirical data set, and empirical data sets gives us trends, gives us behaviours. If, if a survey says, why is it foul? Um, and proves it didn't, does that give us confidence and all those kind of good things. That's my piece on infrastructure data for the time being. But ultimately, and, and this is a project of a vehicle, but ultimately more data is good, but that does mean we have to apply an incredible amount of intelligence to use it smartly. Brief background to the 153155 from a mechanical perspective. Originally, the one, uh, uh, originally manufactured as two car units, the, uh, now they're converted into a single car, so the fundamental difference between them is the weights and, and, the, and the weight balance at one end and the other. Um, from a profile perspective, very similar, um, but, but weight's different. Um, the uh, image on the left is the... Um, left. <laughs> the, the image on the left is the, is the traditional vehicle model. Very simple. <coughs> Some points to... to uh, to, to highlight, no projections, always a, always a good start. So ultimately, if we, look at the, if we look at the pictures, we have projections up here, all the way along the vehicle, no projections. Secondly, the footsteps are identical, and they're very crude. They're actually square. Now, vehicles don't have square footsteps. Theoretically, they're square, but they don't have square footsteps. So this jumps out. And secondly, look at all the, look at all the good stuff we have here, and look at our nice simplified envelope. This is typically what we see on, on vehicles of this, of this age. What is it? We're trying to ensure that from a gauge clearance perspective, the vehicle stays inside this and we stay outside it. But ultimately, once we know what's there, we have the opportunity here. And, and I've seen a lot of in these old, uh, in these old vehicle models, as you'll see your damper has been very square um, and ultimately they're not. And that's always a good indication of how good the vehicle model is. A um, bit of a background to, to the vehicles. Bit of a background to the problem. Um, fundamentally, we're talking about platform issues. That's 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 why we we're asked, and, and and the huge scope of work which was being the 890 platform heights, which we we're talking about. So known issues: tight clearances between the platform and the footstep. Here's a good one: tighter clearance in crush inflated than crush deflated. So from a mechanical point of view, we're lower when we've got no air in the airbags than when we've got air in the airbags and fully loaded doesn't seem right. So suspected issues with the kinematics. Consequence, the platform maintenance, and also not only are we designing, uh, designing completely custom platforms, lower platforms increasing stepping risk, but we're just not compliant to the lower sector vehicle gauge, which is all the new, which, which is the lower sector vehicle gauge, lower sector infrastructure gauge, which is going to hamper any form of cascading or movements, even to depots. Now, these are sway charts, so I just want to talk through what you're looking at. Three lines. In, in the traditional sway test, we've taken the, da the datum is taken at, step, at the step height, at the waist height, and at the canter rail height. And as we incline the vehicle, we get roll and we get drop. So fundamentally, as we start to see, as the, as the equivalent cant increases, naturally, they increase at slightly different rates because of the roll position of the vehicle. So, what happens at this point? Well, first and foremost is we have a huge drop, so this seems suspicious. 
But secondly, the drop at the waist, which is in between the step and the cant rail, is more. So, not great. What do we have? This is tear inflated. We have these kind of st strange steps all the way through the vehicle portfolio. Tear inflated, this, if, if, if we look at this in drop in millimetres, so the waist uh, in, in, increases by 10, 20 mil and the step decreases by 10 mil. So the vehicle somehow manages to grow 30 metres when it's in tear deflated, which is um, an, an issue. Um, the, the, the point being here, there's clearly something not right with the vehicle modelling done. It doesn't mean that all the sway test data is wrong, but it just means that, that at the time when this was produced, that, that uh, I, would, I would say that a common sense check didn't seem to be applied in the, in the resultant output. Let's look at the uh, quality of information. We had, we, as I said, we had 800 individual drawings and all paper-based and typically we would uh, our, our, our quest for speed in gauge clearance assessment has caused us to rationalise envelopes so that we have less envelopes. Less envelopes mean it increases clearance calculation time. We believe that's the wrong way to go because you don't know what, then what your clearance is to. It's very difficult to find. So ultimately we went through the, the, all the envelopes found these drawings and then broke them down to the individual components so that fundamentally you can say that that's the gutter, that's this part, that's the taper, that's the end. Passenger footsteps. So part of this is, well, what's, what's the first protocol? Well, let's go, to a, let's go to a depot and have a look. Um, first and foremost, two footsteps, not one. Completely different. The first one is a wider footstep. It hasn't, it, it, it it's got a straight end at the end. It's got a straight part at the end. Um, it also has a tread plate on it. This does not appear on any drawing anywhere, but there is a tread plate with all the anti-grip and, and those things are. So, so there's, a, there's a tread plate. Then there's a second footstep, which has, been, which has been retrofitted. This is a custom mod, which wasn't on the original drawings as well. So go take some measurements, add it on. What's interesting is also in the <coughs> depot where we were, this tread plate wasn't consistent. So not all vehicles had the same at this point. Now, what that means is actually the, some of the, you, you lose some of your second moment of area, and in, in doing so, you lose some of the rigidity. What does that mean? Well, that isn't straight. We haven't got straight, we haven't got flat steps. This comes into the difference between a design and a tolerance. We allow for tolerances, we allow for wear, we allow for creep, but we need to make sure we allow for this. <coughs> so fundamentally, the step which was before rationalised as a 35 mil square, can now be broken down to the individual components, and you can apply tolerances to the various parts of, of the step to say that's going to deflect, deflect all those kind of things. One of the um, interesting points which we're often asked, um, we, we work for a lot of people on, on helping <coughs> vehicle movements last minute, just not part of route gauge clearance, but I need to get it from A to B. And, and one of the things which I think people may be aware of is the idea that we can just take off footsteps and th what the gauge clearance is without footsteps. One of the notes is with these old vehicle models, we can only do that if we keep a, a lot of new vehicles, you can do that, but the bracketry stays the same. So it goes back to why should we cut down these vehicle models into, en into detail? Because we shouldn't analyze this without all the bracketry. If we take the footstep tread plate off for gauge clearance, there's still some substantial amounts of things bolted to the vehicle which need to be um, put in. Uh, uh, another, an, an, uh, if I move to the underframe equipment, this is all new. It wasn't there before, uh, wasn't there in the gauging portfolio before, but clearly all here. Um, Someone asked me uh, in one of the breaks that if, if we get this by laser scanning, if we can go and laser scan a vehicle, the short answer, yes. Long answer, do we really want to do that? What we've got here is our gauging portfolio is a design. It's a design and we apply tolerances to. If we, te if we went and scanned this vehicle, we have no idea what condition this vehicle is in. So therefore, we don't have the ability to say, is the suspension worn? We don't have the ability to say, um, if every vehicle in this fleet has got the same. So we've got to be extremely cautious, uh, cautious with those kind of things. 
Also, we don't know whether the vehicle in its depot is in its, in its resultant position. You know, what suspension condition is it in? Because we currently, as a gauging portfolio, have it as tear inflated, tear deflated, crush inflated, crush deflated. What's it like in a, in a depot? Where, where, is the, where, where is it in that, in that band? Um, but what we can do is we can, use, we can take relative measurements. So if we know, for example, where our design position is for our sole bar, we can, we can take relative positions off there. Um, so, and those are, those are the types of activities which we did um, to not only use drawings but confirm the position, the relative positions of the drawings. It's not every, it, it's not every bit of um, profile on here. What we've done is taken the gauging critical ones, i.e. the ones furthest away from the bogies. So here's what the resultant is. Um, 36 sections. You have two completely separate vehicle models for the 153, 155. You have all the, uh, the, the correct steps, so there'll be two step positions. Um, so your stepping will have changed ever so slightly. You've got here a bogey gauge. So this is to capture things which are mounted to the bogey, which can't be easily quantifiable. And also can't be, by just looking at one or three or five in a fleet, you can't be assured that it's on everything. So this is a level of pragmatism, which we're saying, until we can confirm everything which is mounted to the bogey, We'll, we'll still leave in some space, but you'll see that, that it, it is dramatically, dramatically reduced. So that's the vehicle model, the, the profiles. Kinematic movements, um, fundamentally, there are, we created a vampire model for each of these. I would love to talk to you about the different types of bogeys, but unfortunately that is r well outside my skill set. Um, but this is why we had the help of Resonate, who um, have, have been working with these bogies for a long, long time, and actually were able to do the assessment based on the uh, revised weights and loadings from Porterbrook. And so finally, the before and after. Um, what, what you can see on the, uh, here, this, this, is the, this is the lowest sector infrastructure gauge, which is adjusted for various curves and cancer conditions. So we've gone from a foul position to a positive, condi uh, positive condition. If I bring it to a, I don't expect people to read the numbers, um, good luck if you can, but highlights, red is foul and not good, green is, is, is normal and anywhere in between is positive. So fundamentally for the 153 we have gone from a significantly foul position to a positive position which at tight curvature and, uh, and the uh, and tight count efficiency, we get to in the orders of five, six millimetres, uh, or six, seven millimetres, that kind of order. So we, we're not normal, but we are positive. Same for the 153, uh, one, again, positive. Um, the 153 didn't seem as big, a, there wasn't as many issues, uh, 155, um, but ultimately we've got the same kind of resultant. So, as a, as a summary, highly detailed models result in improved understanding of the clearances. Where is the issue? What is the issue? It allows us to do better types of gauging. Um, significant improvement in the clearance between platforms uh, and, and the, the passenger footstep because we've managed to reduce that, that envelope. Um, one of the points which we retrospectively added in here is it doesn't always, it's not always better. It's because we have added on a lot more components in the underframe. It has improved clearances to the steps, but it hasn't necessarily improved clearances everywhere. We've, we've bolted a lot of pieces to the, uh, the sole bar and the uh, underframe. So it's not always a benefit, but I think the, uh, but the, the, uh, it absolutely outweighs the, the kind of the step issue. Um, we did have a slide in there, uh, uh, the, the client feedback, this is really kind of um, feedback from the projects which have used it, in, in how much cost saving it's, it's had for the, the project. Uh, I think it really establishes the, the principle of um, a bit more analysis, a bit, a bit more data can save us reaching for the angle grinder, which is really what's costing us, uh, it can cost a huge amount of money. Um, Ultimately, if we look at the northern scope, uh, if we ran the old vehicle against the new vehicle uh, on the, uh, the northern franchise, there's 155 platforms which are now not foul from using this. That's not to say that the level of substandard is, is less, it's not dramatically less because we've pushed it into a clearance band, but it definitely changes what we, maybe some of the priorities and all those. Still fouls, 
where we've got high platforms or platforms significantly over standard, but significantly less to worry about. It's the end of my, uh, or, or, or Sean's presentation, should I say. Um, thank you for your time. Welcome, any questions?